Jerry, would you come on up? Jerry DeBan is one of our elders, and uh, I invited him tonight to share with you uh, what God's done in his life. I think it'll really reinforce what you've seen in God's work in him. Good evening. <laughs> He says I'm on. You're on. Well, this may be, seem like an odd place to start, but I'm going to start telling my story. The story that happened in 2006 in Katy, Texas. I had been flown out to Texas by the owner of Academy Sports and Outdoors. He wanted to talk to me about a, a position at his company, heading up the market. And I'm sitting in there, and in walks Mr. Gotchman, and he gets straight to business. Throws a notepad on the table and he said, So, give me an example of your greatest failure in your life. And what did you do? Wow, I didn't see that coming. Kind of caught me off guard. And I thought, Well, I'll return the favor. So I said, Well, actually, Mr. Gotchman, my greatest failure was waiting until I was 18 to get saved. Because if I'd gotten saved three years earlier when I felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit first, probably would have saved the lives of the two babies that were aborted because of me. Probably would have spared a whole lot of heartache and years of struggles from my high school girlfriend, Deji Allen. You see, she learned 1 Corinthians 15, 33 the hard way. And it says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. She was misled, all right. I pressured her to go against her Christian faith and have sex before marriage. And then I pressured her to do the unthinkable, and that is terminate two pregnancies by killing two innocent lives. It cost us both dearly. Here I corrupted this sweet young girl, and then I made her an accomplice in killing two people. But by the way, parents and youth, I have found in my life, gravity in dating relationships tends to work. I pulled her down to my level. Seldom does it work the other way around. I was the bad boy that every parent fears their daughter would bring home. No, I wasn't always that way. I was actually born and raised in a small town in Mount Vernon, Arkansas, 8,700 people in to live there, you had to wait till somebody died because they didn't want to be any bigger. It was like our own little neighborhood. And I was really fortunate because I had a very large extended family. I grew up with all my great grandparents, all my grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins. I lost my first grandparent when I was almost 40, so I really had a strong influence of grandparents and extended family. Now, my sister and I were aware that our mother and dad were struggling in their marriage and things weren't really good at home, but being in that town and around grandparents, they seemed to compensate. They were completely involved in our life and just smothered us in, in love. Some people would say we were sort of rotten by the, by the grandparents. I was 10, though, when our folks announced we were moving out of state, and that was terrifying to us because everything that we thought of as family was going to be left in Malvern, Arkansas. And we were moving away from our own little neighborhood. And that's when my world went sideways. Um, we had, in our home, we had already known what it was like with the, the verbal and even the physical abuse, but it escalated and got really nasty. And then eventually, my sister and I both were subjected to even sexual abuse by our parents. And what kind of parent does that? Well, they split up when I was 13. Dad remarried about, I don't know, three months after that and pretty quickly immersed himself in his new wife and soon after that, their daughter. And he completely, from age 13, my dad completely unplugged from my life. All participation in sports events, school functions, fishing, being together, ended when I was 13. I could count on one hand 
the number of times after that that he and I were even riding together alone in the same vehicle, let alone doing anything. He just, he just unloved. And my mother wasn't exactly a safe haven either. Um, she was fighting her own demons. She had gotten swept up in this whole women's liberation crusade. And she went through several marriages. I quit trying to remember their names, and I just started numbering them. Well, her jaded view of men extended to me, too. I, my wife would say she was a man hater. Anyway, I've been slapped and I've been beaten and screamed at more times than I really care to remember. But I'll tell you the part that I struggled with, that I really struggled with well into adulthood. And that was for years hearing my mother rant about what a sorry human being I was and how ashamed she was to have me as her son. I didn't cope with those kind of things very well at that age. And so what happened was I turned into a bitter kid who grew into a very bitter young man. And I acted out in a lot of ways, but I found that I deeply resented anybody I knew, classmates, friends, who had what I perceived to be normal families, a mom and dad, normal family life, and the traditional Sunday dinner after church kind of thing. Church was not for me, by the way. I wanted no part of church. I wanted no part of any God who would let this happen in my life. And I sure didn't want to hear somebody's sappy stories about Jesus loves me. So what happened was I actually started imitating the very environment I came up in. Drugs, alcohol, violence. Now contrast that. Well, it's kind of funny actually, but it's not. My freshman year in high school, I somehow conned Deji Allen to going out on a date with me. She didn't know it. I was high as a kite the first night I went to pick her up. She had no idea. And about two weeks after that, I nearly blew the whole thing with another little brush up with the law when a buddy of mine and I was getting a car into a roadblock with police met us with the guns gone. And as it turns out in Texas, by the way, minors in possession of alcohol and running from the police are heavily frowned upon. I've climbed out of cars before Dukes of Hazard style. That was the first time I'd ever been airlifted out a window and slapped face first on the hood and handcuffed. That was a new experience. And sitting in that jail when that officer pushed the phone across after they'd taken my picture and got my autograph and said, now I'm called home. And I pushed that phone back and I said, no, no, thank you. Well, let's just say that Dejan and I didn't run in the same circles. She was the proverbial church rat. She had grown up from birth around church, gave her heart to Jesus at age nine, in the church, every time the doors were open, kind of girl. And if her parents had had a clue what kind of boy I was, I would have never gotten in their door the first time. And by the time they figured it out, it was too late. Their sweet daughter, their A honor roll student, their all-state choir cheerleader daughter had already had two pregnancies and two abortions. Well, instead of shooting me, which is what I would do to any boy who hurts my daughter, her parents took a very different route. And her mom was a very strong personality in that family, and so we had this confrontation. And Maggie, her mom, it, it went something like this, and I, I, I remember it well. I'm sitting on the sofa in their living room, and Maggie marched in and stopped herself between the television and me. And her conversation began just like this. Young man, my daughter will not marry a heathen, and you, sir, are a heathen. <laughs> and I just know this. If you died on the way home tonight, you go straight to hell. You know why I know that? Because you aren't saved. And you need to get saved. What do you say to that? 16 years old. What am I supposed to say? This lady looked 100 years old to me anyway. But she was mean looking. 
go. She wasn't through, by the way, which is where my wife gets it. She wasn't through. She said, oh, oh, no, 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 we're not done with this. Here's the deal. You're going to start going to church. We go Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. You're going to go one time a week. You pick the day. I don't go to church, ma'am. Then get out of my house and don't come back. That's blackmail. That's right, it is. What's your choice? <laughs> we started to go to church. I paid my blackmail. I was easy to spot. The kid in the back, arms folded, body language that says, I'm not having a good time. Please beat me up, Scotty. <coughs> For two years, I sat through church like that. Two years, I'm hearing things. Made their way in here and down to here and started to change. I started hearing some truth about sin and consequences and forgiveness and redemption. Things that started to make sense to me. Well, I don't remember exactly what I told the pastor that night, except I went down front and took his hand. Probably said something like, Maggie says I'm a heathen and now I agree with her. I need to get saved. But anyway, I got saved that night. That night, Daisy rededicated her life. <coughs> I'd love to tell you from that moment on, we got married that summer, and it was just a storybook ending of how we've lived happily ever after. The truth is, we really struggled. We struggled to make peace with our past and try to deal with it. It was like this elephant in the room we didn't talk about. And for 10 years, we didn't talk about it. We were acting in church. We were growing in head knowledge, and we worked. But our service was kind of ineffective because we allowed Satan to burden us down with guilt. And then something really amazing happened. God pursued us, David. He reached out. He intervened. He put people in our path, and he put us in a Bible study that finally taught us something that had been there all along. Jesus paid it all. We were already forgiven. And when he died on the cross, he said, it's finished. Not it's mostly finished. He said, it is finished. And when we finally started realizing that truth, God really began to transform our life radically. And in closing, I want to leave you with this thought. We've been married 33 years. God blessed us with three more children, Jacob, Jamie, and Joshua. They love the Lord. They're saved, serving Him. God even led the two of us to help found a crisis pregnancy center in Prattville, Alabama. It's called Grace Place. But only a God, only God, has the power to make something beautiful come out of the ashes of our own bad choices, right? How do I know that? Well, I know what it's like to be the throwaway kid. I know what it's like to endure a broken home. It's been 20 years now since I've seen my mother. I asked my sister the other day, how long since you've seen that? 35 years, she beat me on that one. I know what it's like to be consumed with bitterness. I know what it's like to struggle with unforgiveness. I know what happens when one drink and one drug leads to another. I know what happens when sin has its way in my life. But I also know what it's like to be touched by God himself and made completely whole. I know what it's like to be forgiven, to be washed white as snow. No more stain, no more guilt. And I know what it's like to make peace with my past, finally. I know what it's like to be given a brand new life, a brand new identity. I'm not the same guy who slid the car into that roadblock. We aren't the same kids who aborted two babies. What I can tell you is I've been adopted by God himself. I've been redeemed, I've been restored. I've been given a new identity, and I'm a child of the King. Yeah. I hope tonight that you have seen in that testimony that all ground is level at the cross. And I hope, too, that you have seen in that that one of our dreams and hopes at Living Hope 
is that this be a church for all people, no matter their past or their present. And that we're going to love people right where they're at. And we're not going to shame anyone for anything. And that uh, as God builds testimonies like this in the church, there's going to be people here and feel, man, I can go to that person because they've been through it. They know what it's like. And we're going to celebrate now the good news that we've talked about and we've heard fleshed out. Communion is that way. The Bible says that when we gather for worship, we're to partake of communion.